back. Uh, Dave McHugh is here with us. How are you doing, Dave? Very well, thanks. We're thanks talking about uh, the Volvo Round Ireland race. This is something that I think uh, has been part of the sporting consciousness for a long time, and it kind of flares up from time to time as people kind of tune in and tune out. But this year is a big year for it. It is, yeah. It's, uh, it's a biannual race, so it flares up every two years. Um, and as you know, sailing is not the uh, biggest sport in the world in this country, but you know, the success of Annalise and the Olympics and, and things like that, people are more aware of it. Um, this race has been running since 1980, so it's got quite a strong pedigree. And it's compared to the likes of the Sydney to Hobart, the Fastnet race, the Caribbean 600, the Middle Sea race. And um, it starts uh, from Wicklow every two years, uh, and you sail um, in whichever boat you're in non-stop uh, around the island uh, and try to get back as quick as possible. How long does it take? What's the...? Uh, it's a bit of a, a challenging question to answer because you're so reliant on uh, weather, right. um, your boat, your tactics, your strategy. I suppose, um, on average, it probably takes, takes most boats four days. Right, I would okay. think it's probably an average. So the record in a monohull is 50 hours. Um, so you'd hardly sleep in 50 hours, you know, on and off. Um, most boats are between sort of 30 and 50 feet that compete. Uh, and it really, the, the answer is how much wind, what direction is it blowing from, um, yeah. and, and what sort of tactics do you choose? So they've uh, released this video, and um, you'll, you'll see it shared on social as well. The, the scenery is amazing, and it looks like it's kind of an incredible thing to do. Have you done this race? I have. I've done it three times. Um, I did it first time in 1994, which is a long time ago, on a 38-foot boat. Um, I did it in uh, 1996 and won it on a 35-foot boat. Uh, with Michael Boyd, big ears, and, and the last one I did was I think 2008 on an 80-foot boat. So what's Slightly the difference? Different. Uh, so uh, different, loads of different categories. Yeah, different categories. I suppose you could liken it to golf in that it's a handicap race. So, you know, typically the biggest boat or the longest boat or the fastest boat is the first boat home. Okay. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they win the race. Sure. Um, so you're handicapped. So quite often it could be a boat that comes in two or three days later, who, like golf, has has sailed to its handicap and, and wins on what they call corrected time. So I think the year that we won it in 06, I think we were four days, 11 hours and 27 minutes, I think. And, and we won it, yet the boat that actually got home first was in in two and a half days. Okay. So, so it's, it's a handicapped sport. And really from a spectator perspective, the focus is on the stars, the focus is on Wicklow. Yeah. Um, and it's on that kind of um, notion of come down and see boats. As kids, we all grew up, boats, planes, cars, yeah. you know. So it's a, it's a get down to Wicklow and it's an experience, the festival, watch the boat sail. And following that, it's uh, follow it on a tracker, much like the Volvo Ocean Race. Um, daily updates, how are you doing, which direction you're going, where's the weather coming from, um, and uh, it's very strategic and you need an awful lot of luck. What sort of strategy will be implied? Very much depends on the weather. I mean, I had a little look at the weather for next week and it looks like we're going into another high pressure this weekend. Weather looks sunny and warm, generally means lighter breezes, sea breezes. You know, there's been races in the past two or three where it's been stormy. Um, there was one race a couple of years ago that was postponed for 24 hours because it was too windy to start. Right. So, you know, wind is your friend. Wind gets you around the island as quick as possible. Um, so if it's light winds, it's likely to be a long race and it will favor the smaller boats. If it's a very windy race, it'll favor the boats that get around quickest. And, you know, as a, as a sailing race goes, I know this is kind of hard to explain to non-sailors, but, you know, you go around a different corner every day. You go around some of the most iconic um, landmarks in Europe, the Fastnet Rock, Inistra Hall, you know, down past Rathlin, Mew Island, down the RC. So every day is something different. Um, and that's what makes it really interesting. And, 704 miles if you draw a straight line around, but you know, you, depending on the weather, you could end up sailing 8 900. How close to the coastline do they go? Again, question that can only be answered depending on what the, the weather is is doing and also the tide. So what's, what would give you a strategic advantage? Is there an, like an average ideal kind of like, are you quite far out or do you try and hug it there as much as possible? There are times where you, you can't see the land. I mean, right. particularly going up the west coast, you know, really when you leave uh, Kerry, you, to, go you get to line. Mayo, it's yeah. a straight line. You know, land is visible, barren islands, etc. There are other parts, you know, when you're coming down the east coast where, you know, you see whales on one tack and an hour later, you can see, you know, loud on the other tack. Okay, yeah. So, you know, you're not particularly far away. It's not, it's not, you're not crossing an ocean, you're sailing around an island. So, yeah. 
it's geographically it's uh, it's quite uh, an attractive race and think places like the Fastnet you know it's incredible to see it I mean it's an iconic rock Keep being able to see it from the sea now you can be unlucky enough and go around it at two o'clock in the morning and see just a flashing light but it could also be the daytime presumably like uh, obviously when you're uh, racing around Ireland the thing is the changeable weather so in the middle of a race your tactical approach can be thrown completely out the window yeah so on, on board if we the average crew is probably eight to ten people so everybody has specific roles and responsibilities and probably the key role um, on the crew is, is the navigator or the tactician and it's that person who assesses the weather conditions, the tidal conditions, the positions of the, of the, the other boats, also what's going to happen next and makes the, de the decisions as to where, where you go on the race course and why. So there's a lot of onus on tacticians. So there's weather routings, there's planning, and then there's obviously you know, lifting your head up and seeing what's happening. Um, a crew of eight or ten, you work in watches, um, probably you know watches of three or four. So you're on a rotating cycle of three hours on, three hours off, three hours on standby. So if you're at sea for four days, you know that's reasonably fatiguing physically and mentally. I'm sure you're completely exhausted at the oh, end of it. Shattered. I mean, I was trying to think as how how would I explain this to you? It'd be like ten of us in the studio here at 45 degrees, uh, wet, uh, with a a band playing drums for four days, uh, sleeping and being woken every three hours and being given something to do physically. Why is it three hours? Why would you not be better off like a six hours and get a proper bit of a kip and then... It's a really nice suggestion, but you know, as time goes on, your efficiency becomes um, um, less and you know, your concentration period, you can't concentrate for long. For six hours, time. okay, so that's the issue. Then you're trying to intake food, you're trying to eat, you yeah. know, if you're up at two in the morning, if your watch is from 2 a.m. to 5 a.m., you know, what, when do you eat? You know, do you eat at two when you get up or do you wait for breakfast at five before you go back to sleep? Yeah. You have to fit in your food before you go back for your three hour sleep. So talk me through a two to five hour shift in, in the, the graveyard slot when it's dark out, you're on watch, what are you watching for? Uh, well, you're sailing the boat because you don't stop. So, you, you, you know, you've somebody steer, steering or driving the boat. And then that's... Somebody trimming the sails. And the steering is all done, I presume, kind of like, you don't need to see the rocks there mapped out well, you do, or, yeah. but it's dark, so yeah. you're steering on instruments. Okay. So you're steering on lit instruments, a compass, a wind angle, a heading, and boat speed. And your idea is just to keep the boat going as quickly as possible for non-stop. So you can't just get up at 2 o'clock and go, it's a bit dark, we'll slow down here and take it easy. Yeah. You know, you've got to drive the boat at the same speed that you would if it's the middle of the day. You're totally reliant on the instruments for that. Yeah, I mean, you can get fantastic moonlit evenings where it's as bright as, you know, a midsummer's night. Yeah, okay. Or you can get wet, windy, dark, you know, you can't see anything. So yeah. you're totally reliant on instruments. Okay, and so the the four people on the crew at that point, one of them is sailing, one of them is... So there might be somebody driving the boat, somebody trimming the sails, um, and, and two others just there floating. You know, it depends on how your watch system is structured. But you can't steer the boat for three straight hours, you know, you, you go crazy. Really? You know? Yeah, well, as you get tired, yeah. you know. I mean, you know how you get up for those 4 a.m. flights to go... To a match, you're, you're pretty tired by that's seven. Our, that's our wake up time every, every yeah. day for oh, the breakfast that. show now. So. Yeah, yeah. So, like, I think as, as a human challenge, as an adventure, it's, it's a fabulous thing to do. I mean, it's like a rite of passage for people who sail. How many participants? Um, so, we've, we've just over 60 boats this well, time. Okay, well. um, the record is 63. Um, it's probably about the capacity where, where it needs to be, critical mass. And the boats vary from 30 feet to, in this case, 60 feet. Um, so Wicklow Harbour is the, the centre, the hub, where, where the boats come two, three days before, do their prep work. They all go out then on Saturday morning, you know, between 10 and 11 a.m. The race starts at 2. Uh, there's a, there's a, a mass start between a naval boat and the pier. Uh, we have an air corps display, we have a festival, and it's really, it's, it's, a, it's an event. It's a come down, it's a watch the boats, walk around, see them before they go out, have an ice cream, watch the start of the race wave them around Wicklow Head, which is about you know half an hour, and then really the only way to follow them after that is online, yeah. uh, through imagery, uh, video, and, and through a tracker, which we have is called Yellow Brick. There was a great book written about um, the start of ESPN, and one of the big key moments in ESPN's history was in America's Cup, where they managed to finally get the technology to be able to track the boats and actually film from the boats um, you know they didn't have rights to top quality sports events they invested in this and put all their money in it and one of the American teams went really well against I think it might have been a Russian team perhaps so there was okay. proper like there was narrative around it mm. and um, they realised that if we put technology on 
any sport and explain what's happening to people in the live environment. They're going to sit there and they're yeah. going to watch it on TV. Absolutely. I think if you, <coughs> you look at the, the America's Cup and how it's evolved as a sports event and the technology and the camera angles and the overlay graphics on the race course and the explanation about wind and boat speed and tactics, you know, it makes it much more digestible for a, a, a non-sailor. I mean, even I, I think one of the challenges we had around the Olympics, we're, we're all following Annalise and her success and, you know, you're trying to relay to people people how sailing works with very little picture and yeah. very little um, data. So, I mean, we literally watched the races online. Uh, we looked at mark roundings, boat speeds, positional changes, and then we had to go on the television and try to explain to the general public how it worked. Yeah, not easy. The Volvo Ocean Race, and again, Volvo, you know, they're a huge uh, sponsor of sailing globally, and, and the Volvo around Ireland ties in with their strategy, the Volvo Ocean Race, but they're using a lot of drone technology. So they're crossing oceans, and they're doing these sort of races, but they could be 10 to two weeks at sea, they're able to launch drones off the boats, they're able to capture footage in the middle of the Southern Ocean, yeah. and then they're able to send it back via satellite communications to, to a media center. So what we get to see is this wonderfully edited footage that could be taken, you know, 2,000 miles from land. Um, so, yes, it is becoming a sport that, you know, with technology is far easier to digest, but to the basic person who's just watching and, and, and wondering, you know, it's an adventure race. It's three, four, five days at 45 degrees. What do you bring with you? A toothbrush and maybe a change of T-shirt. Um, you're sleeping in uh, wet sleeping bags if it's wet. Now, you can have lovely weather. It can be beautiful, calm, still, but it's going to take a long time to get around. Yeah. You know, you see dolphins. You see all sorts of wildlife. Uh, you, you bond as a group because you have to. Um, you know, and you it's, it's, there's a huge sense of... <laughs> yeah, well, thankfully, and please God, never. Um, thankfully, um, you, there's a huge sense of satisfaction in finishing something like this, you know, and, and, and achieving that. I've, I've sailed around this island seven, eight hundred miles with a group of people, and uh, certainly it's one of the highlights. And there are many highlights, don't you? it's not all misery. There, yeah, yeah. You know, no, it's a highlight okay. every time you, you jump up a couple of places on the leaderboard. There's a highlight when you see one of those iconic places like the Fastnet or the Tusker, and there's, there's just definitely a huge highlight when you finish the race and go, wow. You know, that's over, I just want to sleep. Where is Irish competitive sailing at, at the moment, given we're halfway through the Olympic cycle? Um, high performance sailing, uh, I think it's in quite a good place. I think they've got a very good structure and process in terms of bringing sailors through a pathway from youth to junior to, to international to Olympic. Um, you know, we're, we're an island surrounded by water, um, our sailing and through their, their, fun, their foundation fundraising have <laughs> Uh, invested quite heavily in a, a performance centre now for Dunleary. That's a, that's a huge step forward. Um, you know, are we? Uh, we're never going to have 15 people at an Olympics in that sport, but we should have a consistent pipeline of people over the next number of years. Absolutely. And in terms of growing the sport, yeah, obviously it's a participation sport, really. Like that's what you want people to participate. What's the next step, and how does that happen? Um, well, it's it's a national governing body issue, much the same as you know the GAA or modern pentathlon or or hockey. Um, you know, trying to encourage people to try the sport. You know, certainly my first memory of sailing was 1986, and I saw Simon Le Bon's boat in Wicklow for the start of the Round Ireland. I'd never set foot in a boat, but it was just that little piece of sailing and music celebrity. and celebrity, and yeah. I said, this looks cool. So how do you get involved? You, you join a club, you go to a sailing school, try it. I mean, it's, it's just a wonderful skill uh, to have, to be able to appreciate and enjoy the water. Um, you know, I think, like all smaller federations or national governing bodies, there's a huge push on membership, there's a huge push on retention and development, um, but we're not necessarily funding the sports at the level they need to be. Always the case. In Always Ireland. the case. Yeah, and yeah. it'll continue yeah. to be. So stuff like the Volvo around Ireland is obviously, <coughs> excuse me, really important in terms of drawing attention to the sport and getting people to go and sample it. So uh, people who want to go down to Wicklow. Saturday the 30th, um, 2 p.m. start. Um, most people should try to be down for 10 or 11. See the boats, wave them out of the harbour, have a nice cream, be part of the festival, um, air corps demonstration, a few other kind of niceties. And it's, it's a fun day out, it's, it's something everybody should, should do, and it's so close to Dublin, so why not? Fingers crossed the weather's good for you as well. Dave, great stuff, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks, um,